Hello, and welcome to this continuing live coding series where we are creating a website from scratch with Python, Django, and the Wagtail CMS. This website is open source on GitHub. If you'd like to adopt the code for your own project or follow any of the conventions or even contribute, uh, you're welcome to check us out. We're rebuilding a site of, that's originally built in Drupal, reporting it over to Python, Django, and Wagtail. Uh, we've made some significant progress, uh, but still have quite a few uh, challenges ahead of us. Currently we're working in the bookstore and essentially it's a fairly st simple uh, e-commerce project or app. It's not doing anything fancy with um, calculating shipping or offering discount codes, anything like that. We're just showing a listing of products that have prices allowing people to add them to a cart and then go through a checkout process. We are using for this e-commerce part uh, code from a book by Pact Publishing, Django 2 by example. The book's source code is open source. It's available on GitHub under an MIT license, I believe. I should say that here. And for each chapter of the book, you have just the source. I think we're on chapter eight for the shopping um, app, <clears throat> the e-commerce app. We're not following this code verbatim. We're adapting it to Wagtail. So we're deviating substantially, but I just want to give credit. This book is very good, uh, and it contains m more than just building an e-commerce site. If you're wanting to get some practical experience uh, you, with Django and web development, and you might want to build your own product or idea, this will give you some very practical knowledge, building a blog, social media, uh, website, online store, an e-learning platform and then of course uh, it's still good I believe to learn rest API's even though people there's a lot of excitement about other uh, rest alternatives like well I suppose GraphQL and things uh, really um, this is foundational knowledge that'll that'll last and it'll be relevant I think for several years even though there's a lot of excitement uh, over uh, the continually evolving technology landscape it's good to have foundations in keep in mind that not every fad is worth just jumping on right away. Give things time uh, to mature and build on things that are already mature, like the Django framework. Okay, so I'm just gonna get some tea real quick. I've got a Scottish breakfast tea, even though it's Almost 8 o'clock at night, so I'm going to kind of mess up my sleep rhythm here. So where are we in the book? I need to actually also open the book off screen because I don't want to stream the book content. I didn't, I don't have a license for that. By example, all right. So the 
we are in, if you do have the copy of this book or you're considering it, we're in chapter eight. And we're not gonna integrate a pay, uh, payment get, gateway today. We're gonna, um, I believe we should be able to create an order flow. I might need to reassess that. Ah, but yes, I remember. Um, I need to get in a better place for managing these updates. So I was gonna do a quick experiment at the beginning of the stream uh, with Pippin, uh, Pippin, yeah. To see if I can either just need to update Django and Wagtail, I believe there's an update for that. Or use Pippin to update those in um, a way that preserves the, um, or constrains the dependency graph. So let's go ahead and create a new branch called Update Dependencies. And head and master are the same as the remote counterparts. So good. It's because I'm on the master branch. So this Django upgrade should be fine. Django 2.2.1. Uh, so I'll just stick with the my familiar territory. Freeze output. New R. Semi-familiar. I am learning all of this as I go. I'm primarily coming from a background in JavaScript development. I'm glad to be doing Python and Django now. If you do have any questions as I'm progressing, feel free to ask in the stream chat. I don't mind getting off topic as well. Anything particularly around web development, open source development uh, of interest. Let's just try running this branch. Whoops. Wrong button. Close these. I've, uh, oh, uh, yeah, let's close it. Let me think for a second. I'll be going from the book. I might leave that open. Let's see. So, I don't have a whole lot of content. I did reset the database. But essentially, um, just as a quick preview of what we're gonna be working on today, hopefully we'll be getting to that. We have a, a store app with um, a product uh, sort of archetype where I've subclassed it uh, to create books. We mainly are gonna be selling books, but there could be other products. And when customers uh, order uh, items, we create an order with their the customer information and related items. Uh, that was actually a little bit tricky to figure out 
uh, I couldn't follow the book exactly because we're using this is the Wagtail user interface, back, Wagtail admin. Uh, it's quite powerful, really customizable, um, but it's not a one to one kind of mapping from Django concepts. It primarily is, but there are some caveats, particularly uh, with this sort of model cluster where you can display inline uh, related uh, entities um, by a foreign key relationship. So it's good to go now. And I think it's running. I think this is a, probably a, a safe pull request. We're in totally like more or less alpha development right now. So I'm not too worried about breaking things. I just want to have it a, a, a good habit around managing these pull requests. Okay, so I will just uh, run this and get push real quick. There's probably some other dependencies uh, that I could be upgrading. The problem is, to my knowledge, pip, uh, what are we at, 19 or something like that? It's the latest. Uh, it doesn't really look at the relationships between dependencies and more specifically that dependency A might be, or yeah, um, relying on dependency B version, you know, one point. X, where the latest version of dependency B is, you know, maybe 2.x. Um, for example, J Wagtail depends on, I don't know, these are probably patch version upgrades. This is a little bit of a bigger one, and Wagtail's a top level dependency, but yeah, uh, it's called a constraint manager, and I think Pippin will resolve that issue and give me a clean way to make sure all of our uh, dependencies are up to date in a way that they're cross compatible. So as up to date as they can be, more or less. But let's stick with our just top level ones right now. We'll pull down master real quick. I'll delete that branch. And I'll pull these changes. I'll close this terminal. Close that shell. All right. So I'm gonna check out the book and see what the sequence the book introduces these concepts. Right now, it's um, the chapter I'm viewing is eight managing payments and orders. Uh, the first thing it has me do is integrate a payment gateway. We're gonna be using Braintree, but we're not quite ready to do Braintree. Uh, Mary Klein, the editor of Western Front, has to do a little bit of more um, sort of due diligence and some administrative footwork to get me a sandbox environment. I'm pretty sure last time uh, I spoke with her that Braintree is the way we're going to go. Uh, it's a subsidiary of PayPal. That means uh, Western Friend is already using PayPal. They'll have their whole PayPal transaction history intact. Braintree will just give the end user more integrated user experience they won't feel like they're leaving uh, the western front website unless i think they if they specify paypal it'll take them through the normal paypal uh, checkout process but i'm saying this because the book is walking me through payment processing right now and I need to actually have a two-step checkout process. Create the order and then create the payment so that we can see when orders are pending payment. So let me double check that I didn't skip something. Uh, 
so I've, we've introduced um, customer orders in the administrative site. Ah, okay, here we go. So now I'm, I guess in chapter seven, I need to create a couple of views. There we are. Creating customer orders. Chapter seven. Subsection four, registering customer orders. So what we're gonna do is create a, an order form. So let me go to the front page real quick so you can see what we've got so far. Mm. Here is, I don't have any content scaffolded. Let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, we just have this up here. So I just need to set up a couple of pages real quick. Just checking the stream to see if there are any chat messages. I do have the stream now, the stream chat in my peripheral vision, so I will. It's kind of in the center of my dual monitor setup, so I will be able to respond quickly to any chat messages. Okay, so while I'm doing this, I'll kind of describe Wagtail for people who haven't seen it before. By default, so Wagtail is a content management system built on top of Django. It has a little bit of opinionated design uh, so that it can do things for you automatically. When you spin up a Wagtail instance, it creates this Wagtail page welcome page. So I just delete that. And Wagtail allows you to define, it's just Django, it, you can define um, custom content types and control the way that they can be organized, kind of like a file cabinet where you only put certain content types in certain folders. So at the root of our site, we really should only see one thing here, this home page. Um, but pretty much everything is right now, most of the content types are being shown here. There are several more, but this is the majority, I think. So I'll create a home page. And I'll just say intro text. So you can see that. And Wagtail has a publication and moderation workflow by default built in. And it's also multi site. So that you can host multiple websites or blogs from the same code base, but at different domains. having different roots. And so the default sets a catch-all site. So now, if I just, by way of example, go back to the root page. Now you'll see this is the site structure for Western Friend. After having deleted the default page and introducing this home page, this is the home in the site layout will carry over, but this is the home page layout and there's this wagtail editing interface. So let's go back to the admin, create a couple more pages. So this is where we'll start to see uh, Wagtail is a hierarchical content model, meaning you nest things sort of like in drawers within drawers and with the um, file cabinet metaphor breaks down pretty quick. So I'll add a child page and now there's a different subset of pages. We're working on the store, so I'll just go here. I'm not going to flesh out the um, whole thing whole content model right up for this development session. So I can just view that live. Here's the home page. I don't have a link to the store in the menu yet. We have there's some significant improvement we need to do here. But there's no products. And I believe I have to add one one more product index page. which I might change the way this works, but anyway. Because the products will render here on the store page. But this is kind of like creating a manila folder that holds all of our products underneath of it. So it's more for the admin section. If I look here, I can go to the store, and I can see there's products under the store. I can also create a manila folder for orders. I think that was my thought process. Uh, you can also customize the Wagtail navigation menu really easily. Uh, so I created this flyout menu with um, 
specific product type and orders. Both are uh, valid ways of approaching that. And just in retrospect, I believe at least the products can appear under this store and the orders are sort of off in their own little land because they're just Django models. Everything else here is inheriting from Wagtail page model. I won't go too deeply into that during this session because we're gonna be working with the order model. I did think for just a second about that. So let's go ahead now and then we've got the store and a products folder, so to speak. If I had a child page, it's gonna to default to a book. It knows that the only type of product we have are books. So for that, let me get some helper text. So this is $18, Faith and Practice. For North Pacific Yearly Meeting. Wagtail also gives you these image handling uh, user flow uh, out of the box. I'll start with just one product right now. I believe the authors is optional. Let me see if I can skip that field. Refresh our store. We have one product here. We're using Bootstrap for our CSS framework. We did a quick evaluation at the beginning of the project. Uh, I don't want to be writing a lot of CSS during development. We want a quick way of getting a mobile responsive uh, website and some basic primitive, um, you know, container elements. So I think Bootstrap's still kind of the go-to thing. This again comes back to a sort of philosophy I've adopted of like not just going for the newest, most exciting solution, but trying to pick things that have been around for a while and are under continual evolution and development. They have a, basically an ethos of stewardship, a commitment to maintain a project for a long duration. Of time they've demonstrated that. Uh, you know, and other things like good documentation and good community um, form, things like that, active developers, friendly developers, multiple contributors, all of those are f sort of factors. Uh, I've been using when adopting and investing my time in learning a new technology and also bringing technologies to bear on uh, solutions for organizations where I work or where I'm volunteering, things like that. I think all of those sort of values uh, I'll apply to the projects where I'm working. So we went with Bootstrap, it's not super exciting but it does a good job and we're using Bootstrap 4, so which is a continuing continuing evolution, continuing revelation. So we have a Bootstrap card here, a Bootstrap button, some form styling, um, basic stuff that comes out of the box. It's, you know, mobile responsive out of the box. Um, and Chromium, so I don't know what the keyboard shortcut is for mobile, for checking in mobile responsiveness. So yeah, you know, it works pretty good. So let's add this to the cart. So this is our shopping cart. We have this checkout button that's not doing anything. So that's where we're gonna be working today. When I click this button, it should take me to a, a view where we will create an order. It'll display an order form. It'll create an order instance in the database. Uh, well, and then an order item for each um, item in the cart. So if we look at our data model real quick, so everyone's on the same footing. Whoops. And then, yeah, I'm not really doing so good about writing tests. We have two models here, order item and order. 
the order contains mostly the customer menu and some metadata about the order status. This is all subject to change, particularly the postal address. I don't have a quick story on how to do this, so I just put a simple text field there. And each order, order it's called a clusterable model, that means it can be shown in line with related entities. Uh, and those entities can be, it's like a cluster of related entities, more or less. Um, those cluster, those uh, related entities can be ordered. They can have a uh, rank ordering. They can be sorted. So this order item represents an item, like a product of book, that's linked to an order by the parent key. This is a requirement of the clusterable model. This is a wagtail specific stuff. This is that we're deviated. Uh, most significantly from the book and a product. So an uh, order item joins an order and a product. So it's a uh, many to one. The relationship between orders and products. One order can contain many products. I have to think of that. It's, it's a many, many to many because each product can go to many orders. The thing is, this is not a foreign key, so it's actually going to take a snapshot of the product, the price of the product at the time of the order and the quantity that was made. So all this is static data. It can be changed through the admin interface. But that way, if the actual product, the price of this book here changes at some point down the road, a month from now, they just say, well, let's give it this, we're now can publish them for fifteen dollars. Uh, all the orders will still be valid. The historical data will still be valid. You know, we can generate PDFs based on back invoices or export CSV stuff like that. And then the last thing is this cart is a session-based uh, storage item, I guess, sort of uh, keeping things temporarily. But as soon as I either log out or uh, clear my browser cache, this, uh, I believe, session would be gone. The session cookie and Django would more or less clean this up. So when it when creating an order, when I click this checkout button, it's going to take this session data and persist it into the database in a static representation. So, first thing we need to do is create a form. I don't know the conventions, but I believe this would be a verb, starting with a noun of the kind of entity the type that you're trying to do, and then by convention just saying this is a form, so having form in the name. And the cool thing is Django comes with a lot of good stuff by default. So I think F12 would go to definition, has this model form that has basically takes a model and will initiate initialize the HTML elements um, based on those model field those model fields. So we're gonna have an order and a view basically that's gonna create not only an order but take these but several order items, one or more order items. What did I do? What's the change here? Let's see if I, nothing. 
form supply has changed. So let's go ahead and continue. So the database model. The database fields we want. Our, our fields are a little bit different. This is for consistency with another model. We adopted these terms. And I believe we got these from schema.org. You know, modeling addresses, modeling names. It's kind of non-trivial stuff. There's a lot of permutations, a lot of uh, cultural, you know, variation. Um, we tend to sort of westernize things and assume that that's the most effective way of doing it. There's not going to be a field there. And in our case, you know, our primarily, our user base is primarily in Western United States. So that, that's an okay way of modeling things. All right, so this is going to create a form. Now we're going to send this form into a view. So I'll hop over here to this. This is a quick aside. Um, Wagtail gives us such kind of strong conventions that it does a lot of the wiring behind us, behind the scenes for us, uh, to, the, to the effect that, to the extent that I haven't had to define a whole lot of views. Um, Haven't had to mess with URLs very much at all. It's it's a really great project if you're just wanting to get uh, your feet wet and start web development and be able to build meaningful things relatively quickly, uh, while at the same time having the ability to go deeper into the framework, uh, Django particularly. So now we're going to create this views. This is a pretty conventional way of organizing stuff. That's another thing I like about these the Django framework is it has strong conventions. A uh, new Django, de or Django developer familiar with Django coming to a new project uh, is going to recognize how things are organized right off the bat. So this render shortcut is going to render out some HTML uh, in sort of, um, what's the word? Uh, well, take a data context and render it into the HTML, sort of interpolate the data into it. Uh, there's a better, sort of a more convention or a more, I guess, colloquial way of saying it. Something like rehydrate or something like that. I don't know, but I think it's in, uh, it's going to put the data into the HTML into the static tempo template. So we need our order items. Because these will be associated with the order, but then we also need order create form, form, which already has a, an association with the order model. So we have a cart class. And essentially, it creates a session variable for the cart, more or less. Let's see what we're doing here. If it doesn't already exist, which I think this is cart, it's a static variable. And gives us a couple of methods to add products to the cart. remove them and compute the price and clear everything out. And it's an iterable. So we'll be using this in a moment. And so you also want to define for iterables, you want to define a length property so we can save three items in your cart. So that's what that method, that's what that uh, class does for us. 
we're going to define a function based view. It takes a request and instantiates a cart from that request. In function based views, you have to do these kind of sort of gatekeeping to check what kind of a method it is. If it was a class-based view, I think that would be, um, those would be methods we would be overriding of the class. But in any case, the book is taking function-based view approach. Let's see. So first go to instantiate the form. from the post data, check if it's valid. So the initial thing is going to create an order in the database, but we also want to save these, uh, the items in the cart. So the order again is just the customer information. So here's where our iterator comes into place. Our iterator function. So as you see here, we our form is gonna create these fields. That'll be part of the post, but we will also have product items in that post request that are just part of this session. So this is the model, this is the database model. This is the model manager, and we have a method of the model manager called create. We have the foreign key to the order. And here I'm debating from the book again. Matter. Let me double check real quick. might actually break. Let me read through this code a little bit better. So we're creating a car item with a product D for each product. And instead this should be this should be product title. Problem is this will break. Actually, so whoops, no. This product needs to be this. And here, when creating it, which is a database instance, we'll get the title. So it's static. And what do we call this? Let me double check my model order item. Product. Yeah, those look good.
there's this is how the book has it. So price equals item. So yeah, these are both numeric values. So we'll create an order item for those with a relationship to the order. And then clear the cart. And then Here's where we'll render a template we haven't yet created. And the context will pass. I believe I can use the I can be a little bit more explicit here. The context is a dictionary with order being the key, the value being this order that we got when we when we saved the form data. So it'll pass it back into the view. If the form is if the methods post, if the form is valid, we don't have any handler if it's not valid. So that's an interesting decision. So if it's not a post, it's a get request. And we're going to send back the form to the client to render so they can fill in the details. Render a template, or some context to the template more specifically. Passing the request data back. Template name equals. Create. So there's create and created templates. We'll need to create. Um, create. Some context dictionary containing the cart from the oops from the session and the form which is defined here Now, since we defined this view, we need to tell Django how to route the traffic. That's done through URLs file. So the good thing of this book is using Django 2, and we have this nice um, new way of defining routes. Uh, instead of using a regular expression, we can use this path method that lets us use a, just a plain string. So we're going to import those, the views uh, into this.
context, I believe that will import everything. I might just want to, well, in any case, let's define this route. Uh, this is kind of strange that they're putting the app name here because normally that's done right here. allow us to get the reverse URL to this view which we just defined now we need to come here to the main app this is our environment so you can see there's a lot of stuff going on in the environment I probably if I had pipinv, this wouldn't be here, so I just decided not to switch to pipinv during this session. But I'll consider it, maybe do it off stream. So our main app is this, actually went the wrong way. Down here, WF websites. We just need to import these orders URLs. I've been kind of doing things alphabetically. Let's see, for our custom defined ones. So there's the orders path. Everything underneath that is going to be namespaced. And we have a checkout button. right here so we're going to now activate this because right now you can see it's just uh, kind of linking to the hash it's uh, more or less just linking to this page it's not really doing anything so let me get a quick t we'll go over and edit html template for this checkout screen a splash of oat milk from little Now we're going to see some yellow text here, but it's not a bad thing. It's, well, actually, we're going to have to create the templates. So the next part of the book is actually creating the templates. But I'll click the link, the uh, button anyway, so we can see the nice yellow text. So if, over here, I go to, uh, so the shopping cart is not in the orders app. It's up here under the cart app. So we haven't transitioned over to the orders yet. So templates, cart, detail, that's showing everything here. And uh, it's you know basically it's a HTML table using Bootstrap um, classes for responsiveness. And down here's the button, and yeah, just link in there. So basically, we're going to use that reverse um, helper. Uh, it's a template helper from Django. So let's do this, and then we want two of these. Oops, two of these, two spaces. So there's a URL helper that takes the name of a uh, view, which is namespaced to the orders app. This, thing, this keeps your code nice and clean, basically. And here's our bootstrap classes. So when I save this and refresh the page, so right now we have a cart hash. This should, I think I didn't refresh the page. Did I? Yes. Now how does orders create? When I click orders create, template does not exist. So no problem, that was to be expected. But you can see quickly that that URL kind of 
helper class. Just does that for me. And then I can refactor the code, or you can have code in different um, apps, and it keeps things clean, consistent, and predictable. So now we're going to kind of hop back over to our orders app. I have the back, so there's not so much bright yellow text on the screen. And we're going to create in the orders a new file templates. And then inside the templates folder in each app, you have the app name so that when Django collects everything together, your templates are still in a good organized, organized structure. They're not all just flattened to one folder. So now here we are. This is going to extend our base template. There. And let me double check because again, I'm not doing this so much by the book. So our block regions are extra CSS, body class. Content. All right. Oh, yeah, I do have a title block. Okay, cool. So close this detail. Override the title. It's not necessary that you name the block when you're ending it, but it just helps for readability. So I create order here so it's more explicit than checkout. Django HTML template, and even my Django autocomplete is not working, so I'm not sure the benefits of here or how I can improve my uh, template autocompletion. We're just going to display more or less the same information as the cart, but this time in, in a list instead of a table. I might actually go against that. I'll see how it looks and just, you know, it might be good to display the same table there uh, without the uh, ability to edit the quantity. I don't know. It's, I think maybe they're, I'm not sure what the reasoning is here, but. Uh, And right now we're hard coding currencies into the templates because we're only expecting to sell things in United States dollars. Dollars. 
hard to adapt currency again. Alright, so now we're going to display the checkout form. This is the part that matters. Again, um, it's just really nice being able to write these templates from scratch by hand using regular HTML and a little bit of a, uh, sprinkles of these handlebar syntax. It means we have full control over how the uh, content is displayed. We have pretty good um, CSS defaults, and we can override those for consistency. And I think it might be more consistent to have this table across the checkout process. From the action should submit here, method equals post. Class equals. Now I've got to lift this up, but uh, bootstrap forms needs a class on the form itself. So I'll leave that off. And here we're going to just display the form as paragraphs. And I believe we can spruce it up with crispy forms in a minute which I think is active on this project has been a little bit since I've been uh, working on this paragraph and then we need an input and a way to submit the form order, create order. Primary. And then we need the CSRF token. It's getting a little bit hard to read. make sure that this is not being uh, this post is not coming from across another site cross site request forgery this is built into the Django framework CSR protection okay and then prettier linden my HTML for me so okay I'm not gonna fight it that's cool so I just had to switch back to regular HTML and I get the benefit of Emmet and Lydia, uh, prettier for linting. All right, so we've got the orders create. Now let's create the created. And from our project, we will inherit. Ooh, what the heck? The prettier do there though. Don't like that actually. Disable it. Disable. Well, I don't want to fight the um, tooling. I just have to kind of decide how to, which trade off to make. Is not expecting these Django sort of helper tags. All right. So what I'm getting at here is I need to copy and paste this stuff. It's the same.
appreciate your order. And I don't know about our content style for this site, if we should be exclaiming or using this kind of word or thanks for your order, more casual. We'll talk with Mary about that. Let's see what happens when we go to checkout. All right. Orders, order, orders. Just one second here. So this prefix is correct. I just don't think I need that. It's a little cleaner. Okay, again, the form is going to be a little bit ugly, but let's see if it works. submitting it here. Also, this form looks a lot uglier than in the book. So if something the book is left out. Pack uh, books are overall pretty decent, but there are times when they leave out some significant stuff. It's a little bit frustrating. Oh, I think I was supposed to download some CSS. That would have fixed it. But anyway, I didn't do that. Okay, well, let's take a step back and see... So things look all right, 2x, uh, that's not working. Uh, item title's not working. So let's see if I can fix that, create. And here's the, probably part of the deal. This actually should be the title. So let me refresh this page, there we go. Two times faith and practice. Oops, we got here. Okay. 
Okay, so we got form validation. That's good. Now I create the f before I submit this. It's going to submit it here. Which is orders create. None of that's really changed. Post form action. Because when we come here with a get request, it renders the form. But when we come here with a post request, There's a branch, so this is good. I'm going to close this. I might need to, but this might be the problem. No, because this view is going to have the branching logic here. So the else is working. Saved. Let me double check here. Orders created. Page not found. Posting to orders. That's the difference. And so it can't find that. All right. Let me check the book. Actually, the template is probably the problem. order button All right, so the dot in the action seem to be the problem. That's from the book. I don't know, so it seems to be going up one level when you put a dot in the action. Hmm. Pretty 
strange. Uh, Unix convention would be dot dot. Look that up real quick for edification. Die in there. We should probably just take the action off or put a hash. Or yeah. Leave it off or put a hash there. It's also working with just the empty st string. So, and we'll get back to that error in just a moment. All right, good. Making progress. Sometimes it's nice to see errors, particularly when they're meaningful. Object is not subscriptable. So let's find out what I've got going on wrong here. Use pi or create line 19. That even gives me a place to look. Wow. So closing this. Don't need that. Mm. Ah, uh, okay. Hmm. Not sure if it'll make pass the stringified version there, or if it's gonna try a foreign key. Let's give it a whirl. Okay, order number four. Orders one, two, three. Wait. I duplicated it. Delete all these. We're really close. So now if I go back to the cart, hmm. it's empty. Good. All right, so did clear out the cart. Let's add just one of these to the cart. We'll go to the checkout. Another name. Well, I deleted all the other orders. And we'll create the order. Five has been placed. Refresh those names. Another name. Inspecting it. One times faith and practice. Not specifically meeting yet. $18. Yep. All right. So everything's good. It's static text, uh, static string the price and the quantity uh, that can be reviewed or modified, but it's not necessarily linking to the original product. I don't know that it would be a requirement, particularly since we're you know, probably not gonna be doing super advanced analytics here, uh, any more than like a SQL group buy on the product name uh, might just do the trick. I could talk to Mary about that if I wanna keep the product ID uh, in place as a reference, then we would have a really explicit thing to group by. Probably more effective or efficient that way. 
the SQL query because I don't know if this field is indexed. But usually uh, um, primary keys are indexed by definition, I think. All right, so this is all working. This is good stopping point uh, in terms of getting things committed now. So, yeah, and these order items were created. So it's everything. This is actually this. What I want to come back to real quick is that it looks like I'm editing an order, and I am. These top fields are part of the order, but these order items is actually uh, data in another table that are being displayed inline. This is really powerful. Django has an inline. Um, I forget the name of the display as well. So we can have multiple order items and we can even update that. There will be definitely some enhancements here. We'll need to calculate the price and display it in this editing. At least the summary here? Probably. I don't know. I think Mary's going to need that information or export these as a CSV. Yeah, this is just first step. So add, create, add or create view. Yeah, so that's good. Progress. Now we've got uh, some user-facing templates and a way of completing the checkout process. Uh, so I think I'm going to call it good here. It's hour and 20 minutes. I don't want to go too much longer. Uh, I guess one quick addition would be, let's go ahead and add a link to the um, navigation menu. We'll round out the half hour. back down here and yeah these are hard-coded links so I'm not really doing anything fancy here I'll figure out a way of uh, creating a, a more automated way of creating this navigation menu that perhaps gives the editor some control over the links their nesting uh, titles, whether or not it's an internal or external link, things like that. But that would be a whole other feature. So we'll save that. So that. And yes, yeah, since we're editing the have bar template, which is part of the base template, we just see that change immediately. And actually, it wasn't too bad. It just wrapped our slogan text, which. Uh, this title and slogan might be moving into their own section of the page. Uh, I figure what the word for it is, bootstrap um, hero section or something like that. Good, good stuff. Okay, well actually that didn't round out the th uh, 30 minutes. But 
and gets us where to hop into the bookstore. Well, <laughs> I see another viewer just hopped on there. Um, just wrapping up the stream. In this session, we completed uh, sort of a checkout process. We've got our shopping carts. We've got a create order form that lists the products, gets some information from the end user particularly so we can ship them these products and creates orders back in the back end. I'll do another one. It creates or displays a confirmation message with an ID. We'll definitely be enhancing these templates including that uh, checkout, that order creation uh, template's pretty poor. Uh, when I refresh the orders back here, then we see that someone else just placed an order. We inspect it here and edit it here, including prices and quantity and things like that. I believe there will be, the next steps will be probably to tweak those templates, um, start working on the payment processing flow. Next week we should have everything in place so that we can do brain tree transactions on a dummy, like a sandbox account. And we'll take it from there and see how, how things progress. And I'm getting feedback from Mary, so she might have some suggestions about uh, what kind of information she would like to collect on the order model, things like that, how we should structure the uh, person's postal address, for example. Okay, this has been another episode of creating a website from scratch with Python. Django and the Wagtail CMS. Appreciate the people who joined the Twitch stream. Uh, the chat was pretty quiet today, but that's not a big deal. I think that's kind of common. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do leave a question or comments below the video. I'll try to respond to those really quick. Again, we're open source on GitHub, so feel free to check out our code. Uh, you can make modifications if you want to contribute. Uh, we've got a few issues you, know, you might be able to help with on a pull request. In general, if you're wanting to learn uh, web development, Python and Django and Wagtail are uh, really good, uh, will give you good foundations. And I think there's a lot of um, sort of wisdom baked into these frameworks. And particularly recommending Wagtail because it gives you a really quick way um, of des developing a content oriented web project with a really nice managing content management interface similar to WordPress but using Python Django under the hood. Alright, thanks again for watching and have a great day.